hopefully, um, I'm going to share some experiences that I've had um, since being an entrepreneur and um, share a lot of the learnings that I've had over the last five, six years, and hopefully it will help you guys be more successful with your startup. So I, uh, I am Ben Curran. I'm the CTO and the founder of Outright.com. Um, I started my journey as an entrepreneur about six years ago. I was at Intuit. I was uh, working on QuickBooks and payroll software, um, a software engineer writing C, C++, C Sharp code. And then at some point I said, hey, I am tired of working for the man and I have some ideas of my own. And I think that I could step out and, and do a good job here. So I um, left Intuit um, the same year I bought a house and had uh, my first kid <laughs> to start a business. Um, had very little income and I started a business um, doing web development mainly as a, a consulting shop. And my idea was to say, okay, I'm going to find all of these projects and make tons of money and then I'll be able to take that money and build a bunch of my own products. Um, it took a little bit longer than I thought it would take. Uh, first, it's hard to find customers. So uh, after a bit of time, I um, actually had that rolling and I could spend about 30 to 40 hours a week uh, doing consulting and then we started spending um, that other time on building our own products. And we built a total of five products fairly quickly, like three to, f uh, three to four weeks like on each idea. Um, tried it out on small bases and just see if we got traction. Um, one of those ideas at the time was called Go Bootstrap, which is now outright. Um, and what, how that came about is um, when I started eSomni, uh, e uh, which was my consulting company, uh, I brought on a partner. And I used QuickBooks desktop software. Um, and it's a real pain to share your books with a partner. So I said, that's, that's, that's fine, I'll just go find a product. That was my original idea, so I'll just use uh, QuickBooks Online or, uh, or find another product. Um, well, two things kind of happened there. Um, one, QuickBooks Online at the time only worked on IE6 Windows. So I literally have, would have to run parallels <laughs> just to run an, a website, essentially. And it was really convoluted and complicated. Um, so I kind of said, hey, I know a lot about this. I worked on QuickBooks myself. I know a lot about accounting. Um, I even, a long time ago, was a consultant, so I've actually done some of this before. And that's kind of the original idea of Go Bootstrap was, hey, build a very simple accounting and bookkeeping solution that I can share with my, uh, my partner and my accountant um, and to keep track of my business. So that is how we got started. Um, that happened about four years ago now. Um, we got, tr we got, gained some traction, enough traction where we were able to raise a seed round. And now we've raised a Series A. Uh, we're about 25 employees. We'll be growing to 50 this year. We have 200,000 customers and continuing to grow and trying to grow to about 800,000 customers this year. So first I'm going to go um, right into what is data-driven decision making. So to me, it, what it is is you're, uh, you're tying your decision to the objective and the outcome. And you make that connection extremely clear. So I'm sure many of you have been on projects um, or building a product or designs, and you get into a room and, and you're like, oh, um, you know, I think this, this workflow should be these four steps. And then someone else goes, oh, I think it should be one page. And you guys argue, and you have really no data to back it up. It's just, at that point, kind of opinion on why you think one version is better than the other. And um, we have a lot of that, especially at the beginning, you know, when you're hashing out ideas. So what, um, what this is, is when you're, making those, when you're making those arguments, you really step back and say, hey, uh, what is the objective of this thing? Is there a way that we can actually try out one or two versions or really cheaply figure it out and see which one achieves that objective better? So I thought um, to get us started, I'm going to start with some actual real world examples that we have done at Outright. And then I'll go back to the basics of like how to run this on your own. So here is kind of a, a typical AB type example. And um, I'm sure you've seen this before. Uh, so hey, we want to increase our registration rates from 12% to 18%. Um, so that's, like, that's the core objective. Um, the next thing uh, we do is we start looking at our, our hypotheses. So we generate a bunch of these, and then you're like, okay, which one do I believe is going to have the highest chance of moving from 12% to 18%? Um, 
So we run a lot of experiments, and this experiment we actually ran last week, and we decided um, to add our partner names on our homepage. Let me step back for one second, explain Outright and what this is so you understand the context here. So um, what Outright does, we've evolved a lot since our original idea. So it's still the base is bookkeeping and accounting and help you run your um, business finances, but it, we do it in an automated way. So um, the, way, the way it works is we have various data partners like Ebay's and Etsy's and PayPal and bank accounts and credit card accounts. And we attach, if you're a business, we hook up to all of these accounts. So you just make, you sell, invoice, get paid, use your credit card just like normal, and our product will suck in all of that data in every transaction. And as it does that, it will figure out your tax implications and how your business is doing, what are your most profitable products, who are your best customers, and things like that. So it's like doing analytics on, on your actual financial data. So um, a partner here is what we would call like a data source. So a partner would be uh, PayPal or Etsy, because um, we support those, uh, th that d those data flows. And so our current homepage, um, didn't really have anything about that, and our hypothesis is, hey, if we told people that, our, our registration rate would actually go up. So you'll actually see here um, the two variants. Hopefully you guys can read that. So there's a slight text change here. That's literally the only change between the A, B variants, and you'll see the bottom one is, uh, it says, hey, you can import your data from eBay and Etsy and PayPal. Um, so just kind of maybe as a show of hands, I'm curious, uh, who, who would think the, the top one would win, the bottom one would win, or it actually makes no difference whatsoever? So let's first start with the top. Who would guess that the top one would have a better conversion rate? Okay, a couple people. What about the bottom one? Okay, more people. And then what about, you don't think it would make a difference? All right, okay, so yeah, so it's kind of tied between the last one and it does make a difference. So obviously we thought this one would do better, and after we ran the experiment, we saw that it actually decreased by 19%. <laughs> um, this would be like, um, this is a very classic example of intuition just being dead wrong. Like, right, you're like, hey, this seems obvious. Our product does this thing. Um, and this is a no-brainer change. So most people would just make this change and just move on with their life. Um, but by doing this, we, can, we, we are now attaching um, like the actual outcomes to the decision and we can say hey that decision was actually not that wasn't a that wasn't a very good decision and And then we can get some learnings from that So we're actually in the process like every time we run an experiment We then go and try to learn and, and get some new learning like why aren't people why does this turn people off? So we have hypotheses there and we're currently working to actually find out um, why the second one didn't win so then we can uh, learn and then the next time we come up with a hypothesis We'll have this additional knowledge um, so I know that's a pretty simple example, but all, I thought I'd take it one step further. So um, homepage testing is something like is very, like that's a part of the funnel that's really important and people always work on it. So we have this concept called champion versus challenger, and I think it's kind of a powerful idea. Um, whenever you run experiments, time is really against, is against you, right? So it's how many experiments can you run in any given time is about, how, is like how, how many times you can learn. So, this concept of ch champion versus challenger, especially for small tweaks like this, like changing button colors, changing text, um, what we do is we just create a humongous list of every idea we have to test on our homepage, and every single week, because that's about how long it takes for us to get statistical significance on our homepage, um, we, we would run an, a variant against the champion. So the champion in this case was the top one, the challenger was the bottom one, and every single week we do that. And then, so the challenger lost, okay, we'll get some learnings, but now we're actually, if you go to our site, we're actually running a different test, and we're learning something new. And I think um, for these simple, these simple type experiments, it's in, important to just, conti just get a process and a rhythm going, to just go ahead and be testing every single week, and then um, and you'll see that you'll get a lot of learnings very quickly. Um, next, I want to start on another example. It's actually the same objective. Um, increasing registration rate from 12% to 18%. Except in, in this, can, in this um, example, we did something uh, slightly different that I think you would find interesting. Um, so our hypothesis here, and it's, 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 it's best practice. Like every time I go to a board meeting, they're always telling me about another portfolio company that put Facebook Connect on their page and, and you know, like, you know, rainbows and unicorns came out and everyone's super happy. 
And, that, and that, that's great. Um, but we, we are in the small business space in finances, and, and we were like, well, I, I, I could believe that could happen for us, but I have some doubts. Some of the doubts are, are people really going to use Facebook Connect to connect to their financial data? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and, because, um, yeah, so, so we could have built Facebook Connect, tried it, and then said, oh yes, it worked, succeeded or no, it didn't. But what we, what we try to do is push our thoughts to say, hey, what's the absolute cheapest way in the world to test this out? So what we ended up doing is we built this experiment. So it looks like we have Facebook Connect there. However, if you actually clicked on that button, all it does is we're measuring the people who click on that button and it goes through the page that says, hey, we actually don't have Facebook Connect yet. <laughs> However, <laughs> You can register this old way, and thank you for the valuable feedback. <laughs> and what's great about that is now we don't actually have to, you know, to put a button up there is very, very cheap. And we don't have to then go and build Facebook Connect, do the support for managing passwords and um, all the other headaches to make this learning. And um, once we did this, what we actually found is that it did not perform to what we needed. So I don't want to go through the detailed math of how we came up with these goals, but essentially what we did is, um, we, took the, we took the current traffic in its registration rate and said, hey, how many of these people have to move to Facebook Connect and at what conversion rate to make a difference? That's how we came up with these goals. But what you'll actually see is we've, we proved here that our goal is 3%, we actually got 1%. Our goal is 10%, we actually got 2%. So if we built this, it wouldn't have performed enough to even justify the investment. So. Do you, uh, do you uh, characterize those kind of changes? Uh, Oh, Besides sorry. the uh, goal that you had and, and your hypothesis, do you uh, add some characteristics when you uh, put them in your data? So for instance, if, well, you're dealing with security. So if somewhere else you have some other goal and you're dealing with security, you can go look at behavior against all your uh, particular hypotheses where you might go into that security realm. We do, so we measure, um, like, we measure a lot of things. And so experiments we have, uh, various hypotheses and we, and we look at these, but we also look at uh, like other core numbers as well to see if they affect other business metrics. I think that's what you're asking, but um, perception of security, and I'm not sure. Uh, perception of security because then you can look at deeper, asking Facebook to oh, security. Oh, I see, and yes. What's going on on the market? You know, for instance, many banks say have a password in one only, so it just allows you um, some extra data that if you wanted to cut it and look at your population differently, there's at least a common point there. You can uh, validate a population. Yeah. I don't, was there a question, is that a question, sorry. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand if you're, you know, if you're adding some extra data there besides. Oh, I mean, yes, and it kind of depends on each experiment, I guess. But in this one, yeah, we would look at, so, you know, sometimes when doing these fake, well, actually, I'll just go to the next slide real quick because you'll see. Okay, so I call this like a fake feature. So it's kind of like, hey, we want to build this feature because we believe it'll be really great and it's going to change all these metrics. Well, um, before you do that, uh, especially if it's expensive and you're really unsure, you know, build a fake feature first and measure it. And then if that works, um, then move, move forward and actually start building the, the feature and, and figure out the rest of uh, the gaps there, essentially. Um, and yeah, you have to look at lots of different things there, and you have to be careful with these two because you can really annoy people. Like in this, in this case, I don't uh, like where we were. Hey, if someone clicked on Facebook Connect and got our our original sign up form, are they going to like hate outright forever? And we just didn't think it would matter, um, and we got no complaints, for example. But you know, it's stuff that you have to watch. Um, and then let's see. So. The third example I have is, is yet, a, 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 yet another way of um, experimenting. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to increase customer satisfaction by making it easier to manage and categorize your transactions. So first, let me explain the product a little bit more. So it's very important in our product to, once you connect those data sources and this data is flowing through, is we do our best to do categorization and tax rollups and all these things, but hey, naturally people have to go in and, and they're gonna say like, oh, did um, this invoice get paid? And they're gonna wanna search their data. They're gonna wanna categorize things and say, oh, 
you thought that was a meal, but it was actually an office supply, things like that. So um, we have heard customer complaints that they're frustrated with the way they have to manage that. So we want to say, OK, let's revamp that. And the way we, we measure satisfaction is something called NPS, the Net Promoter Score. Let me explain that real quick. So Net Promoter Score is what, what you're doing is you're asking people to say, what is, will you recommend outright to a friend on a scale 1 to 10? Um, if they say uh, a 9 or a 10, um, you call that a promoter. A 1 to 6 would be a detractor. And a, um, a 7 and 8 would be neutrals, essentially. And you take that, you take the promoters minus the detractors, and you create an average, and that's your, your net promoter score. Um, and it's a good way to measure customer satisfaction, and we care about it so much that we automate it. So every person who signs up for our, our site, like after two weeks, after four weeks, after, one, after three months, and after a year, they get net promoter surveys, and we attach it to those customers. So we actually have a customer, how they think of our product. We can roll that up across um, like eBay people versus Etsy sellers, so we can actually see that. So for changes like this, why, why it's great is because you can actually make these changes in the core product, and you can say, did that net promoter score change in a positive or a negative direction? So in this case, we said, OK, let's, um, let's update. Let's do like, let's go crazy. Let's, let's make like almost a new account center. So we almost started totally from scratch here because we've heard so many problems here. Um, but we still wanted to, to, to validate our hypotheses. Um, and these are actually the two variants. So the right side is the new version, and the left side is the old version. So as you can probably see, it's drastically different. The way you manage data is different. And this is um, a pretty big change. So I think a couple interesting things that we did is, one is we created the, uh, the right side version, like a really minimal version at first. And it actually had a subset of the functionality that our current version had. So if you gave that to current customers, they would not be very happy because you're taking away functionality, and no one likes when you do that. So we kind of got creative, and we said, all right, well, what could we do to test this but not to annoy our current customers? So what we did is we actually gave it to 50% of new customers because they don't know that that feature exists in the other version. So um, we built kind of the, the core of our idea, and then all new customers for about two days uh, were split 50-50 between the new version and the old version. And, um, and then everything else in the product worked the same. And then over time, they got NPS scores just like everyone else. So we waited 30 days, and we got back our net promoter scores. And um, what we found is that the new version actually has a, 12, a plus 12 NPS score, which is huge. It moved us from a 45 to a 60, what, 67? Oh, sorry. Well, anyways, excuse my math. Uh, <laughs> um, and that brings us to, I mean, that's, that's a very big deal in Net Promoter, in the Net Promoter land. It brought us from kind of better than QuickBooks to approaching Apple. <laughs> so this is, this, is, this is a huge win for us. And um, we actually just, so after that data point, we then heavily invested here, spent another two months adding every single other feature, continuing to iterate on it um, with new customers, and then rolled it out to our full customer base actually about two weeks ago. And now across all, all of our cohorts, you can actually see increases on net promoter score. Um, so this is a really big win for us. So I think um, one of the learnings here that I thought are our best practice would be talking about local maximums. Um, and so what this is is like when you have a home page and you're changing button colors and text, um, you're somewhat assuming at that point that the general design of your home page is reasonable and you're just tweaking it. Um, but if you think of it, like you could have probably come up with 20 different ways of building out the home page. You know, it could be like just an image with a sign-up form. It could be, um, you know, you, the, the ones that scroll down, kind of like the QC merge page. Like, so there's lots of different ways you can attack this problem. So by iterating these in, like incrementally on one version, you're, you're assuming that 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 can reach the maximum potential, but sometimes it's not. You actually have to just completely switch designs. Like, hey, that core homepage design can only get us to 18% conversion. There's nothing you can do more than that. But if you could drastically change the product, you can maybe move to a higher conversion rate. And so that's kind of what happened here. We didn't incrementally make changes on the old version. We just said, hey, we're going to scrap that, come up with a brand new idea, test it, 
And I think it's important to do that when you're getting in this mode of incrementally testing and you're like, oh, I increased it by 0.1%. Maybe you should start thinking, hey, is there something bigger we can do to get, you know, so we don't have this local maximum and really break out of the gates rather than making these tiny, tiny changes. So with, with some of these examples, I'm going to go back into um, understanding, like, why does this matter? Um, like, why are making decisions based on data important for your business? So, I'm not sure if any of you guys know uh, Steve Blank, but uh, he's a, yeah, he's an entrepreneur and a professor at Berkeley. And, I mean, the, he says, a startup is an organization formed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. And I think some of the important things here is repeatable and scalable. So, um, we had this in the beginning of Outright, where you would have like these traffic bursts and signups, like you get on Dig, and all of a sudden you get all these customers. So that's great, but you can't build a business. Well, at least the way we were doing it, you can't build a business on it. So this wasn't for us ever repeatable. There are some businesses that have made that repeatable, but for us, that's not a repeatable way for us to gain customers. So while it's interesting to like short term to say, okay, great, we got a couple thousand people we cannot build a business on top of that. So we had to continue, even after that, searching for other ways to repeatedly um, get new customers. And then scalable, the, the important of scalable is that, hey, if you actually threw more effort at that, you could actually increase the return. So if, if uh, we write, let, let's, let's do an example of, um, SEM is a really classic example. So search engine marketing, you're gonna pay for keywords. You can actually do a lot of research on keywords and you can see the search traffic. So, if you found like a keyword that, um, for us, let's say uh, bookkeeping. So bookkeeping delivers 1,000 searches a day. Um, we need to acquire customers for less than $2. So let's say I could actually run an ad campaign that would get 500 people a day from that search keyword for less than $2. The, the problem with, with that is that the, the search traffic is only 1,000. <laughs> So, like, it's not scalable. No matter how much effort I throw at that, like, I can only get, you know, like 500 people a week or something. There's some, there's some level at which it stops. And um, you really, when you're having a startup, you want to make sure that you are continuing, um, that when you put more effort at a channel, you can continue to grow it over time. So, so when, you when you start your business, you don't know any of this stuff that I'm talking about. So, like, when I started outright, I have no idea that our conversion rate would be 12%, that, like, if someone was active, they have a 40% chance of, be, uh, or activate, 40% chance of active, and that means that they have X percent of pain. You don't know any of those things. You have these, this grand um, uh, vision of your product, and you can make money, but you need to somehow uh, fill in all those gaps and figure out all those data points. So, um, I kind of think of it as, um, when we started out, right, I'm not sure if you guys have played like real-time strategy games, and it's like a map and it's all blacked out and you don't see anything, and then as you move, it kind of like fills out and you can see the land and you can see your opponents. I, I feel like that's kind of what it's like when you, first, when you first start a startup, is it's the world's all blacked out, you don't really know anything. You're, you're like, oh, I have this great product idea. Um, you have no idea if anyone's gonna buy it, where you're gonna find these customers, how much it costs to acquire them, can you, you have just no idea. Um, and, that, and that's fine. So, but what that means is the key is to learn fast. You want to, of that black, that blackened out map, you want to, as much as possible start seeing the land underneath it. So then you can actually say, oh, okay, now I'm starting to understand the variables of my business and I can actually say, yeah, I, I actually believe this is possible. Why? Because I have the data to back it up. Not this, I just have this belief. So learning fast is extremely important for a startup because the faster you can learn, the faster you can fail, which is good, right? Like, so failing, you're not happy about failing, but if you know this is not gonna work and you know that in one week versus like a year, you just saved yourself you know, a lot of time to go try something different. So I think it's really important to learn fast, both on failures and successes. So, um, and, and that is why it's key to be able to make these data decisions and because and, uh, it helps you operate your business and know where to focus. So, with that being said, it's kind of when you want to run these experiments, where should you start? I gave examples of, um, of outright, but we're fairly mature, so we know certain variables. But when you first start out, where you should start really all comes from your business model. <laughs> so um, when, you guys, when you start a business, 
it's important to understand the, the key variables that make you win or lose. And then, and so this is kind of how we look at it at Outright. So if you are a venture backed company, like there's this magic number of 100 million run rate. Okay, so, <laughs> so it's like, how do you get to 100 million run rate in five years? That's 8.3 million per year in revenue. That's like an important number. So if you want to raise, raise capital, figure this number out. Um, there's lots of different business models. I won't go through all of them. We happen to be like a, uh, a freemium SaaS model. Um, you can be just pure paid, um, ad supported, like Facebook, where um, your actual customers are the, uh, are the marketers who are selling ads, and then you have uh, the users who are just using Facebook. You're just creating a platform with, with traffic so you can sell them things. You have enterprise sales, where you're actually um, like pitching and selling to executives who don't even use the product. So all of these different business models have different variables that matter um, for the success of your business. Um, so I mentioned Steve Blank earlier. If you're really interested in this kind of stuff, I would suggest reading The Four Steps to the Epiphany. It's a great book, describes a lot of these things. He's uh, got a really good model on this. Um, so, so, okay, so let me go over our, how our model basically works. Um, when we started, the basic way of looking at this is you look at registrations, okay, times how many, what percent of those people are going to end up paying. <coughs> ARPU is average re revenue per user. Multiply that, that's your revenue. Then you say, okay, now take those registrations times the cost to acquire a user. Okay, so, um, you know, so if, if you're going to make $5 on the customer and it costs you $8 to, to acquire them, it's not a very good business. You're losing $3 every customer. So, um, and then the greater the difference between the revenue expenses, hey, the more profit you make per customer. That's awesome. And then you want to make sure you can get a lot of customers. Um, so that is like the core to our business. And what's great is once you have that, you can start looking at its risks. <laughs> so, you know, you have, when you start, it's like, when I started out, it was me and one other person. <laughs> so we, don't, we can't try like 100 different things at, at a time. Um, so when you start looking at that equation, you can now start looking and say, hey, where are our biggest risks? Where are the things that we're, we really have no clue about? And so like, for us, it was, well, how do you acquire 3 million businesses at no cost? Actually, no one's done that. So, so to me, that's like, OK, how do you do that? That's, that's really, really important. So you'll see when we started, we were like hammering that like crazy, like tried SEM. We tried, um, we tried viral things. We tried affiliates. And we tried partners. So partners for us ended up working. That's a way we can uh, actually, scale, we, in a scalable way, acquire customers. Um, and that's the strategy we, we currently have. But that's why we chose to experiment on that number first. Um, So um, when you start, what's important is to focus all of your energy on validating your business model. The key assumptions there, prove them out as successes or not, and then if, if, like, if once you find out that number is not possible, you need to pivot, right? Change the way your business operates. Come up with a different idea, something big. And this, this is um, where it comes to kind of the lean startup in that world. So the lean startup is really talking so Eric Reese took Steve Blank's, um, his book, and he took kind of agile development and combined them together to create the, the Lean Startup. And he did a, he's done a really good job of taking this decision making and figuring out your business model incrementally over time. Um, he did a really good job at this. And so this is the way he looks at it, where you have ideas, you're going to build those ideas, and they turn into products. When you build those products, you're going to measure it. Um, that's going to turn into data, which allows you to learn and then to make better, uh, better ideas. And you just keep doing that until you prove out your business. And what's great about this, this loop is every time you go through that loop, your intuition gets better. So when, when you first start, you don't know a lot of the, you don't know the variables or how customers are going to act with your product. But every time you go through this loop and you test something, you now have this new learning that you know, so the next time you make a product feature, you actually understand your customers better, you understand your business better, you understand your partners better. And because of that, you start making better decisions. Um, and then each time, it's important to make sure you validate those decisions so you can get more learnings and get smarter at this. So 
let's kind of jump into the idea phase. So it's very important that when you come up with an idea that you can measure its success. And you always want to connect it to your business. So like every, if you looked at every one of my previous examples, you'll see that they're all tied directly to our business model. So why do we care about increasing registration? Because, if, because for every customer that comes into our homepage, if we can convert them to a customer, we now have another customer who's activated who has a higher chance of pain. Very simple. So we've connected it all the way back. Um, we've even done some interesting things, uh, like are people willing to pay for outright? So we had that question because we were focusing so much on customer acquisition, we weren't focusing on the percentage paid. And we came up with an experiment there, very similar to the fake feature that we talked about earlier, where uh, when people came to the outright homepage, we did we actually pres we made it look paid. <laughs> and it would actually go through a sign-up form and ask for credit card numbers and all that stuff. And what we did is we actually just threw it away. We, it was a, literally a blank form. <laughs> we, did some we did validation, like we did a quick check to say, is it somewhat valid? Because we were, we were concerned that people would put in fake numbers. So we said, fine, we'll do quick validation on it. But we literally just put it up, said, hey, outright is paid. People came to the product. And then we just measured how many people would pay and are people willing to pay. And they are. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we found out is, you no, know, traffic didn't just go down. I think our conversion went from 12% to about 4%. However, we now know that people can pay, and we can use that data um, later on to improve our product and to improve premium tiers and things like that. Because uh, we purposely set up the experiment to be the, mo the most harsh, which is there's no free trial. <laughs> you have to give a credit card up front. So you know, we were really, really strict to see, hey, what is the propensity to pay here? Um, and I think I've talked, yeah, I talked a lot about the fastest and cheapest way, and, and hopefully from some of my examples, you are starting to get what I mean by the fastest and cheapest way. I think when people say fastest and cheapest, they're thinking like, oh, maybe we won't unit test. No, we're talking like don't build. <laughs> so the next, um, the next important piece is measuring. So we spend a bit of time on when we're, when we're measuring, actually, let me make sure, I'm skipping the build and the product because I'm, that's what you guys do. So uh, there's lots of other talks on that piece. So I'm just skipping those two, assuming you can build, build your product, and I'm getting to the measuring phase. So the measuring phase is, is you really want to capture as much user information as possible running these experiments. And the reason why is, is when the experiment succeeds or fails, you want that learning. And sometimes you can't find the learning by just looking at the raw data. Um, so it's important to be able to, to connect those data points with actual human beings and, and to be able to go back and, and be able to do qualitative research on that. I've listed a couple tools here. Google Analytics, Kissmetrics, Optimizely, Optimizer and then custom beacons. And, and you'll see that it goes from like the really simple to more complex. So as your, as your business matures, you're gonna kinda go down this chain. And we are currently, yeah, we do custom beacon logs and a bunch of things there. But we still actually use a lot of the tools above like Kissmetrics to run A-B tests and funnel because we wanna be you know, cheap and quick and I don't wanna build all these funnel, funnel tools. However, Kissmetrics, we actually do get the identity of users and we sync it back up with our data warehouse. And that actually allows us to, if, if a person, if a cohort does, when they go through a funnel, if they perform different, we can actually go and call those customers and ask them why and to follow up with them. And I think that's the important piece because, yeah, when, when you get to the data piece, you really are going to want to look at the data and then you're gonna find different trends and uh, the fact that the trends are different is interesting, but, but what you want to do is then connect why is that data, why did that trend change, and that's where real learnings come from, and it's important, and that's why it's important to have those, that user level information. Um, also, so with data, you're gonna do a lot of stuff in, in spreadsheets, in pivot tables. I don't think I've ever used a pivot table in my entire life until I started doing a lot of this. Um, so you're going to go into your databases. At, at the beginning, so at Outright, let me give you an example. At the beginning, 
we have this, we were a Rails app, we have this application database. I would just go in and like dump user tables and do crazy queries with like dates and I mean it was like ridiculous the amount of queries that I ran, run it through various scripts and then I'd put that into Excel and then I would build a chart. Uh, and that's pretty much how I did all of the analysis. And, but it works really well in it, at the beginning. Um, as you get more sophisticated, you'll build things like a data warehouse. And a data warehouse takes all of those data sources and puts them together and allows you to do that analysis all in one, all in one spot. Um, our data warehouse, for example, we, we connect to KISS metrics. We use Zendesk, so um, all customers like will will create tickets, and we associate their user ID when they create tickets on Kiss on uh, Zendesk. And our data warehouse will actually pull in all tickets created and put it into a central database, and then our application will grab data and put it into a central database, and we can actually mirror that up. So we can start asking questions like, when someone registers, if they submit a ticket in their first week, how does that correlate to active use over time? Like you could actually a ask, answer those types of questions, which in general is pretty tough to do um, one-off. But over time, as you get more sophisticated, you can, you can keep doing that. So I would suggest that at the beginning, you just use tools like Kissmetrics. They'll give you high-level data. You're going to probably run a bunch of ad hoc queries and just throw whatever you can together. And then over time, as that becomes more and more comfortable, you'll start building more and more tools that enable this analysis and to do even more rich analysis over time, which enables you to do even better decision making. And then lastly, for the learn, it's not only important to take the data and to do the analysis and to, to understand um, the people behind the data. Um, once you have those learnings, you need to build in this, this cycle to, to, for your organization to learn and make decisions. So at this point, we have Outright has 25 employees. We're trying to grow to 50. So I can't just keep all of these learnings in my head. Uh, you want to encourage other folks and other departments to be able to create these learnings and to share them with the team and everyone gets smarter um, and everyone be able to provide their own experiments. So, there's a couple things that I think are really important. One is just create like a Google spreadsheet that has like all your experiments, just a list, just list all your various experiments you've ever done, uh, what the hypothesis was, was successful or not, and why. Very simple. Um, every time you run an experiment and something happens, make sure you share it with your team. So just send out an email with a summary saying, hey, this is what we learned, because of that, this is the next thing we're doing. Um, those two things are, will greatly help your organization get better and more ana analytical thinking. And then lastly, what's important is iteration speed. So what you, as a startup, what you really want to optimize for is how fast can you get through that feedback loop. Because the faster you can get through the feedback loop is the faster you're learning, which is the faster you're uncovering that map and the faster that you can find out, is this business for real, and can we scale it, scale it, and can we grow? Um, and it builds your intuition, so you're making wiser decisions. When people are arguing, you actually have data to back things up, like, oh, do it this way, because we ran an experiment that way, and it failed. That ends an, a, 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 an argument very quickly. And you can show them the data in the spreadsheet. See, here, here it is. Is yours different than that? If so, let's try it. Um, it's also nice to empower your team. So we're building tools at Outright for developers, to, like a beta section. And what they can do is they can take any idea they have, and they can put it under beta, and then people can opt into that. And when they opt into it, we will collect data on those people versus the others. So engineers can then say, I have this idea. They don't have to go through this management chain of approval. They can put something out there. They can collect the data. Once they've collected that data, they can come back to the product team and say, here, here's a cool feature. Why? Because I thought it would do this, and this is what it does, and look at the core numbers here. Um, we did this with one of our engineers. He built um, like a, a small Google Chrome plugin to allow people to categorize, and that was under our beta. And um, even the ledger, or sorry, the account center, <laughs> that's the public facing name, um, when we built the account center, we were giving it to new users, but in the beta section, we allowed people to opt in if they wanted to. So even like existing customers could have opted in if they wanted to, even though we were 
kind of forcing half the new people into them. <coughs> So with some of this knowledge, hopefully it gives you enough context and a pointer to some tools to go and do some of this yourself. <laughs> so this is actually really easy to get started. And I think once you get used to making decisions this way, it's really empowering because you no longer have this kind of voodoo magic anymore. Um, so I really encourage everyone next week to just try an experiment, just anything. Use Google Analytics, use, use Kissmetrics, whatever you can. Yes, Doug? So it's clear, I mean, you spent so much time on this, and you have a lot of custom tools, and I mean, even though I had some insight into your, what you guys have been doing, I'm still really intimidated by this. <laughs> and so I, I know that there's got to be other people here who are also intimidated by this. And Get, can you give some really practical, specific ways that, for people to get started for their first experiment? Yeah. So whatever you're working on now, just whatever you're working on now, think of the one thing, think of one small test you can do that's going to, to increase a number. So hold on, there's two areas. There's, there's one where you don't even know what numbers matter. Um, but we can all agree like registration rates in general are important. So I, the most concrete thing is, what's the most important thing bothering you right now in your business or worrying you? Think about that number and say, how can I prove that inexpensively and cheaply and quickly? I can guarantee everyone here, if you just got together with like one other person or by yourself and you just wrote that down, you'd come up with a bunch of ideas. And then, how can you do that? So you'll have all these ideas, and then how can you test it cheaply? That's the, like the two things, right? Like, this is, the, I'm trying to change, I'm trying to change this, how could I do it? Brainstorm. Then each one of those brainstorming say, how could I test that brainstorm? So you might say like, oh, build this whole community site, and, and if I did that, then our viral coefficient will go crazy. Okay, so think, so that's great. That's a great idea, but how can you test that? And um, we've actually had this. We're actually talking about adding social features to the product. And, and what we did is we go, okay, well, why do we want to add viral? Because that's going to help bring in registrations. So you can kind of go through that workflow of, I'll just go through my thought process of how we did this. So it'll take you through a workflow of going, so how, if someone shared, how many people see it? What's the percent of people that will click through? to do our homepage, and then how many people would register, and that's, a regist and that's a registration. So if you did that math very quickly, you, could, you can actually come up where this would only make, this feature would only make sense for us if it delivers X number of customers per customer coming in. So if one person came in and recommended, we need at least 0.5 customers coming back. And if you did that, you can actually follow through that chain, and you can say, oh, so they would have to have at least 1,000 Facebook followers to make, it, to make that happen. And then you can just disprove that right away just by thought, you know, like, because not many people have 1,000 Facebook followers, for example. Um, or you would say, I'm not sure. And we've done this before. For example, we were, um, we were saying, we want someone to share and to come back and register into Facebook. And we were like, well, but we're small business. So how many people, like if I'm friends with people on Facebook, how many of those are also small businesses? Right, so uh, games like the it's to everyone essentially. So if you share that to you know to your hundred friends, there's a much higher chance than saying, oh, it's this very specific thing for a small business because how many people are um, are small businesses? And so that variable like made it made us concerned. And we devised an experiment to prove that variable. And the way we did it is, if you think about it, it doesn't matter if the share came from your product. So what we did is we actually just created custom messages and emailed our customers and said, hey, will you help us? post this on Facebook with this link. And we measured that link. And we just literally had our real customers manually post it there. And then we measured conversion. And then we said, OK, is that conversion high enough that would make this equation work? So like just something like that, just like a thought experiment. And it's really trying to change this number with this feature. How does this feature connect to that number? Build that out. What are your concerns? Build an experiment on that thing. Kind of long-winded. Is that? <laughs> yeah. Or are you more intimidated now after that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Uh, 
So, <coughs> your earlier example where you showed like the Facebook Connect thing, mm -hmm. and, or actually from before that we showed the um, the partners, the pay with mm -hmm. partners, and you had like a, uh, you know minus nineteen percent. Um, the one thing that, that struck me there was, at what point would you just go and, uh, instead of running all these numbers, at what point would you just go and ask some users, like, or would you would you ever do that? Ask some users, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you uh, register, or why wouldn't you sign up with this text on the page, or you know, um, or do you do you just keep trying to use more data to solve to figure out why your data is showing? So in that question, is it? After the experiment failed or before we ran the experiment? After the experiment failed. Yeah. So after it failed, that is what we would do, is go talk to people. But some things are kind of, some things you, even they don't know why. Right. <laughs> you know, so like, why would you register with a red button, not a green? I mean. I think, I think that's an important distinction, especially after some of the other talks today about, that are really focused on go out and talk to your users and talk to your users and talk to your users, that some people, you know, there are things that even people themselves don't know why they do them. Yeah. So, I, I spent like an Intuit, for example, we, we spent a lot of time with uh, like fo focus groups and before building something, doing UI mockups and showing them to people. I, I think there's a lot of value there, but over time I've put more onto quantitative and just experimenting. And I, the reason why is because as it becomes cheaper to experiment and to, um, as it becomes cheaper to experiment and to build those experiments, it's, it, real data is better than someone saying, like you, we could go to customers and say, would you pay for outright if it were $100? And they're gonna go, yes or no. But that, you would see that that, and then if I actually put a page that says it's $100, it, it, it would vary greatly between the two. What if there was like, so in the, the first example where you showed like, where you showed the, the partners and stuff, or not, in, yeah, in the first, where you showed the partners, what if that day there happened to be a report on the news or something in the newspaper about like, uh, or over that, over that week, like there was something that happened that, um, that made people just a little bit more reluctant that week. Yeah, so you have to be a little bit careful with that. So we do that with like tax messages, for example. Um, so one, we, you know, you split the traffic, so at least you're not, you know, so definitely don't go the route of just putting 100% one and then going, oh, this metric is different than last week's. That's, don't even, that's just a really bad idea. You gotta split it because, yeah, things change on a daily basis and uh, so if you split it, uh, you know, 50-50 or whatever, 30-70, and you wait for statistical significance, that, um, like that's one way of getting around that. But then you, have to, you do have to be aware of other things that could influence it, especially on timely manners. And that's what I was saying, like our, our headline on our page, we test that, and we've tested it each different quarters. And during tax time, of course, tax messages work way better. And during um, the beginning, before tax time, getting organized works better. So, you have to, th yeah, and, and a lot of that stuff you kind of have to think through. Um, and you have pretty good gut about it, like, oh, this could, you know, th this could change, you know, uh, seasonality. And then make sure you realize that. So do you periodically revisit failed tests in case it was an environmental thing that's changed? Like maybe attitudes towards Facebook Connect have changed generally? Yeah, I mean, that does happen too <laughs> over time because when we first, yeah, if you were doing, if we were doing Facebook Connect two years ago, it, compared to now, it would be drastically different. So yes, I would, but this experiment happened to rerun recently, but yes. You mentioned uh, log beacons, could you define that? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. So log beacons are, it's like, you, you see them all the time, like uh, Google Analytics, it's like a JavaScript, it's a JavaScript piece that says, oh, this event occurred. Um, what that is doing behind the scenes is it's just going to, a, to some site and uh, it's hitting some URL and that thing gets logged. When that thing gets, it just creates a huge log of these events. And then what our, a data warehouse is gonna do is going to grab those logs and then to go through them and turn them into some schema that you can then uh, query. Like that's, that's, so that's one data source for us. And we build that in, Ruby, because uh, like our system, we hit multiple s systems and servers. Um, so, you know, a user could hit this web server and then this web server, and then this web server. Uh, they could also, every request can span multiple, um, like we have a service oriented architecture, so it can hit multiple services. And so we'll log in all those places. And then at one point we grab all those logs 
process them and put them all back together, essentially. And that's what you're doing with Zendesk as well. It's another big log of data. Um, and then your application database, and you're pulling all that stuff together into a data warehouse. Um, do you find that you um, maybe read into your data warehouse, kind of, uh, like sort of had to iterate through because maybe your hypotheses or kind of your uh, goals or granularity change, for instance, and overlaps that kind of thing? Yeah, so. I mean, yeah, we build everything iteratively. So yeah, when first the data warehouse was like one table or you know, like one fact table, like registrations with a couple uh, dimensions. And then over time, we've built more and more. And we added like, we built a mobile product. Well, all of a sudden, that's a new thing that you have to start adding that concept into the data warehouse. And then yeah, as you run certain experiments, like um, A-B testing, like we didn't have, we didn't have like strict um, A-B testing hooked into the data warehouse. And so there, there's that as well. Like when, once you did that, you have to now have that flow through the data warehouse and be able to split data on that, on that uh, attribute as well. So I think it's just iteratively, you have, to, you have to do that as you find new needs. We just don't have that, yeah, big companies, they would have a whole team of like eight ETL and data warehouse guys and analysts and they just do this all day long. And for us, this is you know, just an engineer spending a part of a time on, part time on this. Yeah, Doug? Jen, I don't want to sidetrack too much, but you said that you're hiring designers and developers. Oh, yeah. Right? Um, and I didn't want tomatoes thrown at me because it's, yeah. So, <laughs> I know it's Cincinnati and everyone wants. Yeah. As you know, and in the office is this, I mean, it's a gorgeous upstairs loft in Mountain View, right across the street from Red Rock Cop Cafe, and right on the restaurant row there in Mountain View, walking distance of the train station. Uh, Walking distance to the to the running trails all over there. Do you want to be a recruiter for us? You can come up here, no problem. <laughs> now spend thirty seconds talking about your efforts in recruiting in that to that office. Well, yeah. So I mean, yeah, rec recruiting is a full time job. I had no idea when I was starting a company I was going to spend so much time just re recruiting. Um, well, so there's a, there's a bunch of engineers. But there's also a bunch of companies. <laughs> and so it's highly, highly competitive, high rates. The best people, like anything, are taken. So you have to have, you have to be pretty creative to get the great best people because you don't want just someone who can program. You want someone who can program and who's really smart and can be on their own and, um, and really has the passion to help your business grow. And to find those types of people is extremely challenging, even though there's a lot of engineers there uh, because they're tied up. They have their own ideas or they're at, uh, like LinkedIn or Dropbox or all those guys are right in the exact same area. So we're all competing against the same talent pool. So I would say, that, yeah, while there are more engineers, there's a lot more competition. You know, there's a lot of competition trying to grab the same pool of engineers. It's extremely competitive. But I mean, for an example, I spend probably about 40% of my time recruiting. <laughs> and I have yeah, I have an office manager who dedi who's dedicated to um, like candidate flow. I've got two hiring managers that help, and then our team when we uh, do coding interviews and things like that. So I mean, we are, and that's like uh, something that we've gotten a lot better at. That just like just like the uh, the challenger um, champion versus challenger, you just get that process going. It's the same thing. Like I'm here, they're interviewing. <laughs> like that's happening right now. <laughs> I think you had a question as well. Um, yeah. Um, so the, the lean startup stuff I've been kind of getting into, but it seems like all the examples are, are web companies. I was, I mean, so my question is, how much of this do you think applies to like like real life? Well, like, real life. <laughs> oh, uh, like other businesses. Like, let's say I want to I want to open a driving range downtown. What kind of experiments could I run? I see. Like, in, in, under, under this model. Interesting. I, I guess. <laughs> I haven't thought about it much, but I am from the, okay, so with that being said, I am from the desktop world. So before I was at Intuit and we had a yearly release cycle on QuickBooks. So it makes it tough. So uh, definitely the, the, the slower that feedback loop is, the less this works. And it's the same thing with kind of when we were talking about the UX um, and doing qualitative things up front, like, oh, here's, a, here's design A or design B, which one do you like better? I think 
the real, why would you do it up front versus um, quantitatively after? Well, quantitatively always gives you better data, but some, it usually costs a lot to build two versions. But if you can reduce the cost so much, then, it, then why even ask up front, right? Just go, oh, here, here's two versions and put it out there and then they'll, people will tell you with real data. So I think it's this kind of the same thing there. It just depends how fast you get that feedback loop. And, and, but I don't know how you would do some of the fake stuff, right? Like you come to your, <laughs> your range and you have the, like a sign that says, here, you can rent this gun and then it doesn't exist. I don't know. I, you know, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> okay. But it's definitely that, the feedback, feedback loop. Yeah. And the, the tighter the feedback and the cheaper you can do it. Yeah, and that's why the web is so great, right? Because um, we, for example, do continuous deployment. So I can code something now and have it in production in five minutes. So if I want to know something, I can just try it. And that's really fast. But if we had uh, like a traditional software development process where it takes two weeks and then it goes through QA and then, and then it goes out four weeks later, I would no longer going to go, oh, I'm not sure. I'm just going to try this in two seconds. Like, you, you wouldn't do that anymore. You're going to go, well, now I'm going to really think about it. I'm going to ask people. And it ch changes your behavior. But as soon as the, and that's why I think the web is so powerful because you can get that really quick. It's easy to split test things. You know, it just reduces the cost of all those types of uh, activities. So I think, yeah, once you start removing that, you, yeah, it may not be as worth it anymore. <clears throat> this may be apocryphal. I heard a story about an author who A/B tested book covers in like a Barnes and Noble. Oh. Basically, just printed book covers cheaply and wrapped them around other books. And oh. There oh, there you go. Yeah, that's a what a great idea. Great idea, actually. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> okay. So, thank you, Ben. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, you guys.